capture. Should just keep it on. Oh no, you just mean use that. Okay.
this is what. Welcome, everybody. The subcommittee will come to order. Uh, welcome, everybody, here. This is a packed room. This is great. I love to see all this excitement. Um, members present will be permitted to submit written statements to the, included in the official hearing record without objection. The hearing record will remain open for five calendar days to allow statements, questions, and extraneous material for the record subject to length limitations of the rules. And with that, um, I love the, the name of this or the, uh, the title for this hearing, Black Flags Over Mindanao, Terrorism in Southeast Asia. Um, I think it's so important today to address this growing threat throughout the region. I'm gonna put on my new glasses, my wife got me. Most of the debate in Washington about U.S. policy towards Asia focuses on state challenges, such as the nuclear belligerence of the DPRK, the rise of China, and related issues. The threat of transnational terrorism in Asia has been at best a secondary consideration and at worst an afterthought. The policymaking community doesn't seem to consider terrorism in Asia with the same seriousness as it does in the Middle East terrorism, with Middle East terrorism. But ISIS increasingly uh, aggressive moves in Southeast Asia, which has, have come to a head in recent weeks, have shown us that the issues are indivisibly related and that the laxity of our approach is no longer tenable. The looming threat of ISIS has exploded into open conflicts in the city of Marawi on the island of Mindanao in the southern Philippines. ISIS fighters have occupied areas of the city for seven weeks, resisting efforts by the armed forces of the Philippines to drive them out. Fighters from domestic terrorist organizations who previously operated under their own direction appeared to have united under an emir appointed by ISIS. Reportedly, this criminal named Isnalan Hapalan has been in contact with ISIS leaders in the Middle East and seeks to establish an ISIS caliphate on Mindanao. The, Isl Isl the Islamist <laughs> Militant in Marawi are an elite alliance of Abu Sa Saif group and the Mote group, um, the Philippine organizations who have come together for this audacious and unprecedented attack. To date, over 380 Islamist militants have been killed in the fight, far surpassing early estimates. And the number of militants, I mean, th at first, when this first started out, we were looking at about 250 to 300 people, and it's already 380 have been. Uh, um, killed in fighting, with more still, <coughs> excuse me, with more still keep government forces at bay. An unknown number of foreign fighters have supplemented militants from the Philippines. Deceased terrorists have been identified as Malaysian, Indonesian, Saudi, Yemeni, Chechen, and Indian nationals. The destruction has been Im immense. Up to 400,000 civilians have been displaced. 90 soldiers and police officers have been killed and hundreds and hundreds wounded. Large areas of Marawi have been flattened. The widespread destruction is the latest sign that the nature of terrorist activity in Southeast Asia may be changing. Islamist militants in Southeast Asia were previously focused on domestic concerns such as gaining independence and establishing Sharia-style governance. Many were thought of as little more than former for-profit criminal organizations as organizations throughout Southeast Asia have pledged allegiance to ISIS, however, their priorities seem to be shifting. The siege of Marawi has shown that forces under Hapalon are intent interested in seizing territory and contesting government control similar to ISIS strategies in Iraq and in Syria. The Solicitor General of the Philippines has stated, what's happening in Mindanao is no longer a rebellion of Filipino citizens. It has transmogrified into invasions by foreign terrorists who heeded the clarion call of, the ISIS, of ISIS to go to the Philippines if they find difficulty in going to Iraq or Syria. They want to create Mindanao as part of the caliphate. At the same time, Southeast Asia's youth, uh, our internet-connected population, is f a fertile ground for online radicalization of ISIS specialties. A fragmented ISIS can inspire homegrown terrorists send trained jihadists all over the world, and the poorest borders of the Southeast Asia uh, uh, region are especially vulnerable to both. The dangers stand to grow as ISIS is driven from its captured territory in Iraq and Syria and turns its focus elsewhere. Meanwhile, Southeast Asia's historically tolerant and inclusive brand of Islam is facing fundamentalist challenges as well. 
The recent electoral defeat and subsequent blasphemy convictions of Jakarta government Ahok, a member, a member of Indonesia's Christian minority, raised questions about the independence of Indonesia's secular institutions and showcased the rise of hardline Islam, Islamist politics. The spread of fundamentalism throughout Southeast Asia, ex exasperated by outside influences such as Saudi Arabia's propaga propagation of Wahhabist institutions risk contributing to radical radicalization. The United States has a role to play and has been quietly supporting the armed forces of the Philippines outside of Marawi with intelligence and surveillance assistance. To date, we have avoided a public role of combat or combat operations. As the threat in the Philippines and throughout Southeast Asia intensifies, we must determine what more the United States in cooperation with our ASEAN partners can do better to counter Islamist militancy in the region. The siege of Marawi underscores the Isl Islamist terrorism by a generational challenge in Southeast Asia as it is throughout the world. Strategies to counter the rise of the militancy must be a central component of our Asia strategy rather than a secondary issue. Today we are joined by an expert panel, and I appreciate you all coming, that will discuss the contours of the threat and suggest policy options for forming this strategy so that we can pass this on hopefully to the State Department and to the executive branch. And without objections, the witness written statements will be entered into the hearing record, and I now turn to my ranking member for any remarks he may have. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Chairman, thank you for holding these hearings. Thank you for the clever title. Um, thank you for the comments about uh, Saudi support, not for so much for terrorist organizations, but for an extremist Islamic uh, clerics who uh, lay the groundwork and advocate if they don't plan and conduct uh, terrorist operations. I've had a significant discussions with the foreign minister of Saudi Arabia who tells me they're not doing that. They're certainly not doing it anymore. That at most they funded the construction of mosques uh, decades ago, which now may have been taken over by clerics they don't support. So I'm hoping that one thing comes out of these hearings, and that is a letter to the Saudi foreign minister identifying very particular um, uh, mosques and clerics and uh, uh, that we think are being funded by Saudi Arabia uh, or individuals therein and uh, let's run to ground whether or not Saudi Arabia is at this time funding an extremist uh, version of Islam. On Monday the Iraqi Prime Minister al-Abadi declared victory over ISIS in Mosul that's a welcome development, but the battle with uh, ISIS-affiliated groups in Southeast Asia, particularly the Philippine terrorist groups, continues, including uh, uh, Abu Sayyaf and uh, Ma'ati, and uh, continues in the Maha Marawi uh, area of the island of uh, Mindanao. A few dozen foreign fighters have traveled uh, from abroad, perhaps more than a few dozen. Uh, they include nationals not only from nearby Indonesia and Malaysia, but also Saudi Arabia, Chechnya, Yemen, Morocco, Turkey. The ongoing fighting in uh, Marawi uh, has reportedly left over 500 dead, including 90 Philippine soldiers, 39 civilians, and 381 ISIS-related fighters. The Marawi uh, battle illustrates that uh, despite counterterrorism successes, that considerably downgraded Southeast Asian terrorist groups in the late 2000s and the early 2010s, the terrorist threat in the region may uh, be getting a new lease on life, and this new generation of terrorists could gain strength by drawing on support uh, from ISIS. Southeast Asian countries continue to face threats of local and international terrorism. There, ha there are over a dozen armed Islamic uh, groups uh, in the region, uh, ISIS has already successfully recruited about 1,000 nationals from Southeast Asian countries to come support their efforts in Syria and Iraq, their so-called caliphate, uh, we hope dying caliphate. Um, as to counterterrorism, uh, counter in the past we have seen al-Qaeda's influence uh, appear through uh, Jamia uh, Islamiyah, a terrorist organization and its affiliates. 
which claimed uh, responsibility for the 2002 Bali attacks. Today, the battle for Marawi, uh, we see ISIS influence uh, elsewhere, not only there, but also uh, in other parts of Southeast Asia, in Indonesia, the Mohajedin, uh, uh, Indonesia, Timor, MIT, pledged allegiance to ISIS. ISIS uh, even uh, has a dedicated Southeast Asian unit, um, Katab uh, al uh, Nusantara, uh, that is fighting in Syria. A, a small as smaller splinter uh, terrorist groups create their own space in Southeast Asia, breaking from larger groups that may have been uh, uh, very relevant a decade ago. We uh, need to continue to monitor, prioritize, and designate. Uh, we should continue to work with our regional partners to combat and eliminate terrorist organizations as well as prevent ISIS terrorists from returning from their countries of origin in Southeast Asia. As to our budget, we must ensure that American leadership is maintained, uh, particularly in Southeast Asia. The President's uh, budget seems to do the opposite. Um, is Southeast Asia is the home of 625 million people and about 15 percent of the world's Muslim population. American foreign affairs programming in this region should not be uh, reduced. The, but the 1918 budget uh, proposal would reduce VOA broadcasting to Indonesia in the Bahasa language uh, of Indonesia. That is not a reduction that I support. Um, we should not neglect the tools that strengthen long-term fight against terrorism. Those are, among others, democracy, the rule of law, human rights, education, and development. Without robust state and USAID programs, Southeast Asia would likely be a less stable area and provide for increased space uh, for uh, terror recruitment. That is why more than 120 three- and four-star uh, retired generals and admirals uh, wrote to House leadership in February of this year urging that the U.S. maintain a robust foreign affairs budget. Never have we heard clearer words from our retired military. I yield back. Thank you, Ranking Member. And um, for you guys that are here what are going to testify, we run our meeting a little bit different, our hearing. Uh, it's a little bit more informal. I want you to be engaged because what we're looking for is solutions, solutions to bring this threat that's affecting all of humanity, it's a scourge on humanity, to an end. It's isolated right now in that one area um, in Mindanao. I mean, it's all over that whole area. But if we can bring it to an end, um, I want you to think of solutions that you can give us, and I've read every one of your testimonies. And I'm going to switch now to my colleague, Ms. Ann Wagner, to introduce a person from her state, and I'll take it over. Go ahead. Thanks. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, uh, for hosting this important hearing. I'd like to take my time to welcome Dr. Sheena Greitens, uh, who, among her many accomplishments, happens to be the first lady of my home state of Missouri. Dr. Greitens holds a Ph.D. from Harvard University and a master's from Oxford University, where she studied as a Marshall Scholar. She has previously served with the U.S. Department of State's policy planning staff and as a non-resident senior fellow at the Brookings Institution. Dr. Greitens has distinguished herself as a professor at the University of Missouri, where she has played a leading role in establishing the Institute for Korean Studies. Your book, Dictators and Their Secret Police, Coercive Institutions and State Violence hit the shelves last summer and its fascinating take on the foundations of authoritarian power in, uh, in Asia. It is, I think, exceptional and all too rare that a busy mother and professional, much less one who's so involved in uh, Missouri's public service, uh, and I speak knowing something uh, about all of these things, makes time to produce a world-class research on uh, Asia's internal security forces. We are delighted to have you um, and, and such an, a notable scholar in the governor's mansion. And I particularly uh, appreciate your work on Korea and the Philippines. And I look forward to our continued collaboration and to your testimony today. So welcome, Dr. Greitens. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yeah. Thank, thank you. And I appreciate, again, I can't tell you how much I appreciate you guys taking your time out. And the way this works, I'm sure you've been here before. you got the timer in front of you. Uh, you get five minutes. Um, try to get as close to that as you can. And I look forward to getting into the question area. 
And with that, we're, we have Mr. Thomas Sanderson, Senior Fellow and Director for the tr tr uh, Transnational Threats Project at the Center for Strategic and International Studies. Welcome here. We have Ms. Supna Puri, Research Analyst for the Counter Extremism Project. Welcome. And then we have Mr. Michael Fuchs, Senior Fellow at the Center for American Progress. Look forward to hear, hearing your testimony. Mr. Sanderson, we'll just go down the line, press your, bite, your mic button, and uh, take it off. It's on. Excellent. Thank you. Chairman Yoho, Ranking Member Sherman, and distinguished members of the subcommittee, thank you very much for the honor and opportunity to testify before you today on the threat that ISIS poses to Southeast Asia, an issue that has gained greater attention since the battle in Marawi, Philippines began on May 23rd of this year. This now seven-week-old conflict involves U.S.-advised Philippine armed forces and police and ISIS-affiliated terrorist groups, including the Abu Sayyaf group and the Maute group. My written submission for the record covers the history of terrorism in Southeast Asia, touches briefly on the activities of Arabian Gulf states in the region, and then goes into detail on the global threat of foreign terrorist fighters or foreign fighters in the battle at Marawi and well beyond and the implications for that region and for the United States. My oral comments now will focus on what I see as the most significant issue at hand, ISIS foreign fighters and their presence in Southeast Asia. Reports from Southeast Asia find that several foreign fighters are among the militants that have died with reports stating that the casualty count shows fighters from Indonesia and Malaysia, nearby states, Yemen, Morocco, Saudi Arabia, Chechnya, and now one from Singapore. And the chairman also noted one from India. Furthermore, there are indications that between 40 and 80 foreign fighters are in the immediate vicinity of the battle. For the past two years, my colleagues and I at CSIS have been investigating various dimensions of the foreign fighter threat. And as you all know, since 2012, more than 40,000 fighters from 120 countries joined the battle in Syria and Iraq, primarily on the side of ISIS. I would discourage anyone from thinking about killing down that number because more can join. That 40,000 number is not finite. An unknown number have been killed in battle. Some are in prison in the region or in back home. But an unknown number is still engaged in battle planning and onward movements to where we do not know. And let me also note, as the chairman noted, there are between 800 and 1,000 Southeast Asians that have made the visit to Syria and Iraq. That, again, number is not certain, but it is roughly in that range. What we see in Marawi tells us that the grim reality is something else. Many who went to Syria and Iraq had no prior military training. What they did go with was a sense of purpose, a desire for adventure, revenge, income, and respect. Some were politically and religiously radicalized. Some went for the good compensation package. For those that did survive and seek to return home, they realized that they have few options. Most nations do not have a program to demobilize and reintegrate those fighters who played more of a support role. Indonesia and Malaysia do have a demobilization, de-radicalization program. The Philippines does not. This off-ramp to membership in a militant group is an important way to divide those who can rejoin society from those who pose a grave danger and should be prosecuted. The actors that we are most concerned about are those that received combat training and experienced high-intensity combat in Syria and Iraq. These are terrorists who are accustomed to the rigors of urban warfare, who know how to build and disguise bombs, operate small and light arms, launch mortars and rocket-propelled grenades, conduct secure communications with encrypted devices, raise and move money, manage logistics, and funnel images and propaganda into the social media stream. These conflict-hardened terrorists, if they do make it back to their home countries or end up in third countries, in many cases would face police and military forces with little or no fighting experience. It would not be a fair match. These violent extremists have experienced what they see as legitimate, divinely sanctioned fighting. They are heroes to their friends and many others and are unlikely to want to return to a lifestyle less meaningful in their eyes. And they know that returning to their families and communities is not likely an option. Governments know that these terrorists have long, unexplained absences or have even been bragging about their exploits in the Middle East. Back home, torture, prison, and execution awaits them. Again, the f options are few. Meanwhile, U.S. and coalition-backed Iraqi forces, Kurdish forces, and others have made strong gains against ISIS-controlled territory in Syria and Iraq. What was once an area as large as Jordan under their control is much smaller. At least 60,000 enemy combatants have been confirmed killed, and ISIS revenue is falling fast, and it's vital for attracting, equipping, and retaining ISIS members. 
In Moscow, a few months ago, a colleague and I were able to interview the family of a Dagestani fighter who joined the battle in Syria before ISIS emerged and then came under their control. Heading back to Dagestan is not an option for this individual. We heard for three hours the contortions that he and his family have gone through to find a third country in which to find themselves and secure themselves. That means these guys are moving on, often not back to their own home. Three years ago, when my team began looking at foreign fighters, energy and attention was focused on stopping them from going to Iraq and Syria, on discovering and disrupting their facilitators at home and en route, and trying to get an understanding of what foreign fighters were doing inside the so-called Islamic State. Their influence back home via social media was also a great concern. But as ISIS fortunes changed, attention shifted to what foreign fighters might do next. The battle in Marawi, Philippines, provides a sobering example of one of those options. Bringing the fighters' expertise, networks, funding, and fighting credibility to bear on insurgencies in other countries is appealing to some of them. Returning to their home countries or to third countries to stimulate moribund terrorist groups, recruit new members, and take revenge on governments they see as repressive extends their lives as heroic fighters and gives them purpose and status. Marawi is a powerful reminder of what they are likely to face in other parts of Southeast Asia in a wider globe when foreign fighters move on from Syria in the Iraqi battlefield. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Peary. Chairman Yale, Ranking Me Member Sherman and members of the subcommittee, I appreciate the opportunity to appear before you today to discuss the threat from extremism in the Philippines. Mr. Chairman, could you pull the mic a little closer, maybe? Yes, my name is Sapna Zaidi Piri. I'm a strategic policy analyst at the Counter Extremism Project, a not for profit, nonpartisan international policy organization that works to combat the growing threat from ex extremist ideology. Fears of growing ISIS activity in Southeast Asia became all too clear with the siege on the city of Marawi that began on May 23rd. Despite President Duterte's statements yesterday that the siege is likely to end within 10 to 15 days, he conceded that ISIS remains a long term threat to the Philippines and the region. In addition to the domestically radicalized Muslim youth by Abu Sayyaf and the Mok group, Philippine intelligence believes that some of the ISIS-linked fighters in Marawi were foreign fighters from Indonesia, Malaysia, and the Middle East, as mentioned already. The presence of foreign fighters reinforces the argument that pro-ISIS propaganda has the power to unify militants across borders in Southeast Asia, raising the possibility that the Philippines could become an ISIS hub if extremism in Mindanao is not addressed immediately. ISIS is the most successful brand of Islamist extremism globally because it has identified a formula to connect its fundamentalist principles to proactive action by its adherents. It has been effective and consistent in spreading its propaganda over the internet and via social media platforms in numerous languages without much interference from tech companies or effective challenges from progressive Islamic organizations online, which we often ca call counter-narrative. In the Philippines, ISIS ideology filled the void left by the death of Abu Sayyaf, group founder and charismatic cleric Abdurajak Janjalani. There's unfortunate continuity in this statement since the ASG under Janjalani and ISIS are both Al-Qaeda offshoots ideologically. Janjalani fought in Afghanistan in the 1980s under an Al-Qaeda Mujahideen Abdul Rasul Abu Sayyaf, for whom Janjalani named his terrorist organization once he returned home to the Philippines in 1989. ISIS rhetoric now replaces Janjalani's voice to radicalize youth in Mindanao, along with other extremists like the Mok Group, whose leader studied in Egypt and Jordan before successfully recruiting via social media and through the Islamic schools in Mindanao itself. ISIS ideology targets Muslims in person and online by preying on existing grievances and co-opting them, offering a singular solution based on the distinctive identity marker of faith without requiring an adherent to understand the faith itself. Examples include the off-sided identity issues of lone wolves in the West and secular separatist movements turned Islamist like Chechnya in the 1990s and 80s, or even economic marginalization as in the Philippines today on the island of Mindanao. A critical bridge connecting root causes to violence in the name of faith is the proliferation of proselytizing within Muslim communities by individuals or organizations often labeled orthodox, fundamentalist, or puritanical. Professor Mohammed Nawab, Mohammed Osman of the S. Rajaratnam School of International Studies in Singapore argues that this indoctrination towards fundamentalism needs to be addressed by governments wanting to combat extremism. For example, in Malaysia, he notes that the increased fundamentalism of the community has damaged the coexistence between Muslims and non-Muslims mm -hmm. present for centuries in the region. That attitude is problematic, he states, because once one starts dehumanizing one group by saying they're deviant, infidels, or hypocrites, it makes it easier for people to be influenced by the ideas of ISIS, which advocates the murder of Muslim religious minorities, non-Muslims, and homosexuals. 
as examples. Consequently, the U.S. must expand its counter-extremism strategy to push allies like the Philippines to embrace a two-pronged strategy beyond the military policies, which are important. First, we must work to remove extremist propaganda online and on the ground, especially among student organizations and schools. Second, we need to replace the extremist propaganda with counter-narrative ideology and messaging formulated by moderate and progressive Muslim organizations. To succeed, these ideas must be implemented domestically and regionally, as well as online. The U.S. can assist the Philippine government in their effort to remove extremist propaganda from the internet and social media platforms by working with them to develop policy and by helping them discuss the issues within the private sector and within the tech industry specifically. Indonesia is of particular importance given that it hosts about 70% of pro-ISIS websites in the region. And that information, the visuals, the YouTube um, videos, it reaches the Philippine population as well as the rest of the region. Second, the U.S. can advocate for the Philippine government to support community efforts to prevent radicalization because community leaders, rather than the government, are possessed with the credibility to build grassroots counter extremism and programming that focuses on educating the public on the values underlining pluralism, tolerance, and community building across race, ethnicity, sect, and gender. The Philippine Center for Islam and Democracy is one such organization that deserves government and international support. The center has been working with the Muslim religious sector, particularly female religious scholars and madrasa teachers, to develop capacities and competencies in strengthening their roles as advocates for peace and human rights. For this purpose, the center has developed human rights training within a Sharia framework and a peace education manual. Regionally, we can also support cross collaborations with organizations like the center to build counter narrative information, books, and um, content that can go online as well. Uh, regionally like minded organizations include Nadlatul Ulama and the Wahid Institute in Indonesia, Sisters in Islam in Malaysia, uh, which Specifically, Sisters in Islam focuses on promoting universal human rights, including advocacy for women through an Islamic lens. Sisters in Islam has challenged in the past the legality of child marriage and polygamy, for example. <coughs> it is critical to legitimize peaceful debate within Muslim communities and protect balanced and progressive grassroots voices. The U.S. can encourage allied governments in Southeast Asia to recognize grassroots organizations as a source of strength to counter extremism and protect their right to speak and engage with the public. Thank you. Dr. Greeton. Thank you very much. Chairman Yoho, Ranking Member Sherman, distinguished members of the subcommittee, uh, it's an honor to appear today to discuss the threat of terrorism in Southeast Asia. My remarks will focus on American security cooperation with the Philippines, the U.S. ally most affected by this threat. For time's sake, I'll focus today on the policy recommendations that are contained in my longer written testimony. Before that, there are two brief points that may be useful. First is that the Philippines has a more complex security environment than most other U.S. allies in Asia because of its internal challenges. Manila has always had to balance between external defense and internal needs, which include both disaster relief and counterinsurgency or counterterrorism. Under the previous president, the Philippines had be begun to shift toward that more external maritime focus, but Duterte's presidency, combined with recent developments, are returning them toward a more traditional inward focus. Second is that the Philippines is an incredibly pro-American place. There is, however, a long-running concern, particularly on the Philippine left, about potential encroachment by the United States on Philippine sovereignty, and that's directly affected our security cooperation and basing agreements in the past. Our alliance generally fares best when we just acknowledge this domestic political reality. In the past two decades, U.S.-Philippine security cooperation has focused on counterterrorism and most recently more on maritime security. As we all know, we're here today because in the past year or so, concerns about terrorism have increased. Those concerns center on these so-called black flag militant groups uh, in the southern Philippines who've sworn loyalty to the Islamic State and achieved recognition from them. Uh, as well as on the ISIS-affiliated uh, fighters who are returning to the region. Uh, today, these ISIS-linked groups in Marawi have held territory in an urban siege that has lasted almost two months and claimed an estimated 500 lives. Abu Sayyaf has also increased its kidnapping for ransom operations, which raised substantial revenue for the organization and jeopardized the safety of trade in waters around the southern Philippines. Today, I'd like to offer seven primary recommendations. First, Congress can play a real positive role in strengthening America's security cooperation with the Philippines. 
Despite Duterte's rhetoric, the Philippines remained strongly pro-American and congressional engagement could productively focus on places like the legislature, the departments, the military, local governments, and civic society, all places where the value of the U.S. is broadly recognized. Second, Congress can build on broader outreach to ASEAN to show that U.S. support for the region is strong and bipartisan. I commend the subcommittee's activities on that front thus far and hope that Congress continues its engagement in this economically and strategically vital region. Third, the United States can con continue or consider expanding maritime security assistance. Congress played an important role in establishing the Maritime Security Initiative in Southeast Asia, and it is important that even as the Philippines confronts intensifying internal threats, it does not ignore external defense needs. Maritime security assistance can improve Manila's ability to address multiple challenges at once, disaster relief, counterterrorism, and places like the South China Sea. It also allows Congress to support our shared, two countries' shared security goals while remaining a strong voice for human rights and the shared values that underpin the alliance between our two democracies. Fourth, if the Philippine requests, the United States should examine its options for reactivating formal counterterrorism cooperation initiatives, such as the previous Joint Special Operations Task Force Philippines based in Zamboanga. Our military is already providing technical assistance in Mindanao, so clearly defining the parameters of that engagement and its compatibility with the Philippine Constitution can help avoid domestic blowback and keep the focus where it fundamentally needs to be, preventing ISIS from establishing a foothold inside the territory of a U.S. Asian ally. Fifth, we can support Manila's cooperation with other U.S. security partners. Trilateral patrols, which recently begun with Indonesia and Malaysia, are an important step and will be more meaningful as the Philippines continues to improve its maritime capacity. That's a place where partners like Japan, Australia, and South Korea can all play an important role. Sixth, the United States can identify productive forms of economic engagement, including regional tools for counterterrorism finance. Like maritime capacity building, financial tools can address multiple priorities at once, such as counteracting North Korea's money laundering and revenue generating activities in the region. It will be important to limit the flow of funds, especially now, from ISIS agents in the Middle East to groups in the Philippines and Southeast Asia. Seventh, the United States should monitor two issues that are likely to affect recruiting and support for ISIS-linked groups throughout Southeast Asia. First is the peace process in Mindanao, where the collapse of the 2014 agreement has contributed to individuals and factions splintering away from the Moro Islamic Liberation Front toward these more radical groups. Second, the treatment of the Muslim population in Burma could well become a recruitment tool and a rallying cry for Islamic militants region-wide. The U.S. needs to be carefully monitoring these issues and supporting effective, inclusive, long-term solutions. Thank you. Thank you, and I appreciate the passion in that. Uh, that was good. And now we'll go to Mr. Fuchs, if you would. Great. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman, Ranking Member Sherman, and distinguished members of the subcommittee. Thank you for the opportunity to appear at today's important and timely hearing. Terrorism in Southeast Asia is a serious challenge and a direct threat to the lives of innocent civilians in the region and to U.S. national security interests. The United States has a direct interest in working with the countries of Southeast Asia to counter terrorist threats and can do so most effectively through building capacity, supporting democracy and human rights, and investing in the necessary diplomatic and development tools. Terrorism has long been a threat in Southeast Asia, and the potential return home of Southeast Asian fighters who have fought in Iraq and Syria are raising fears that they might exacerbate an already dangerous network of terrorist groups in the region. The governments of Indonesia, the Philippines, Malaysia, and others, including the United States, are focused on countering these threats. There is much work to be done, and we must be vigilant. This threat, while dangerous, is a threat that we can tackle. With focus and practical efforts, the United States can help these countries make real progress. There are many challenges that the United States and the countries of the region face in combating this threat. Governments in the region are often hamstrung by a lack of development and governmental capacity. Few economic opportunities, weak government institutions and rule of law, and porous borders are just some of the many obstacles the countries, countries of the region are up against. The United States, too, faces difficulties. An over-militarized CT approach can be counterproductive. Rhetoric and actions that feed a, quote, us versus them dynamic hurts U.S. counterterrorism efforts. And likewise, a lack of investment in resources can hamstring U.S. policies. There are a series of steps that the United States can take to make more progress, and I, too, have seven recommendations. First, 
the United States must strengthen its diplomatic and development capacities in Southeast Asia, including through more personnel and resources. U.S. diplomats are best equipped to lead the charge. They often know best what is happening in these countries, have the best relationships with foreign governments, and are best positioned to develop locally tailored strategies to prevent terrorism. Gutting the budgets of state and U.S. aid, as has been proposed by the Trump administration, will unilaterally disarm U.S. counterterrorism policy. Second, the United States must prioritize support for democratic, rights-respecting governments and societies in Southeast Asia. The stronger the democratic institutions, rule of law, and tolerance in these countries, the more effective they will be at preventing terrorism and the more resilient they will be in weathering any threats. Third, the United States needs to support the institutional capacity of partner governments. We should look carefully at how best to support countries developing legal frameworks for combating terrorism and training law enforcement and intelligence officials, to name just a couple of examples. Fourth, the United States should invest in economic growth and development. While the region overall is growing economically, millions of people remain impoverished and living in communities cut off from economic opportunities, creating environments where people are too often susceptible to terrorist propaganda. Education and cultural exchanges are crucial here. We should be inviting young leaders from around the world to learn in the United States, not making it harder for them to come to this country. Fifth, the United States should use the military sparingly and judiciously. The U.S. military can help prevent terrorist acts when used carefully in conjunction with other tools, as has been proven in the southern Philippines. But at the same time, we must be aware of the sensitivities of a heavy-handed U.S. presence in the region. Sixth, the United States should support regional and international efforts that can strengthen cooperation amongst the countries of Southeast Asia. From ASEAN to the Global Counterterrorism Forum to working with other partners like Japan and Australia, there are numerous opportunities for the United States to support regional counterterrorism efforts in Southeast Asia. And seventh, the United States should engage with the countries and peoples of the region as partners instead of lecturing and criticizing. People around the world look to the United States for leadership and to uphold universal values, and so the United States must act in both word and deed to strengthen those universal, universal values, not to foster perceptions of an us versus them mentality. Thank you very much. Thank you, and I appreciate everybody's testimony. And uh, we're going to break rank a little bit here, and I'm going to let Ms. Wagner go first because she's got another meeting that she has to, and then we'll let the ranking member go. Thank, go thank you very much both to the chairman and to the ranking member for their courtesy. I've got a press conference on human trafficking with the speaker in about 12 minutes. So um, the conflict in uh, Marari is highly concerning, and my heart goes out to all those who have lost their lives and critically important. Uh, Dr. Greitens, you mentioned in your statement the June launch of joint patrols and information sharing between Indonesia, Malaysia, and the Philippines. Increased regional cooperation has the potential to be helpful. How can the United States better support regional counterterrorism and border control efforts? Thank you very much. You know, we're really seeing the, the very beginning of, a, of some of these forms of multilateral cooperation, particularly, as you mentioned, the joint patrols are only a couple of weeks old. Um, and one of the things the United States can do is continue to support the uh, intelligence surveillance reconnaissance capabilities that would guide and, and uh, support those patrols. Um, and to, continu to continue to build, uh, via assistance to the Philippines, its overall maritime capacity. Uh, the general, uh, my general sense of these patrols is that the capacity of the Philippine government in the Sulu Sea and around uh, that, in those southern waters, is an area that particularly needs to be, uh, to be beefed up. Um, and that that is an area where the United States, along with other U.S. security partners like Japan, South Korea, Australia, um, can be particularly helpful. Great. Thank you very much. Mr. Sanderson uh, and Ms. Peary. As you know, many Indonesian officials have been educated in Saudi-funded schools. Uh, there are multiple strains of sal uh, salif sal Salafi <laughs> ideology, as I understand it. How does Salafi ideology express itself in Indonesia, and how influential is uh, Wahhabism? Mr. Sanderson. That's not an area of expertise of mine, but let me indicate from fieldwork that I've conducted in the region among all these countries, is that a, Indonesia in particular has a very large, <coughs> moderate, uh, mainstream Muslim community. They have large- Are there moderate uh, political and jihadi strains uh, uh, in, involved or? Uh, absolutely, I mean, in every country you, you would find those. Um, Indonesia happens to be a, an excellent example where you have very large communities that have 
<coughs> rejected those more extreme, intolerant interpretations of Islam. Uh, groups like Nalatu Ulama, Muhammadiyah, and other community groups um, are, are, have rejected that. You saw it in the response to the 2002 Bali bombing, where there was a rejection of J.I.'s vicious attack that killed 202 people. So that works to our advantage in the region, but you do have the influence of more extreme forms of Islam that have come in from the Arabian Gulf uh, that have been pushed through schools and through mosques, and that is of concern to us. But let me turn to my colleague for more details on that. Thank you. I, I think the issue of Gulf state funding in general, non-Arab countries with Muslim-majority populations is an issue because when we look at the way various Muslim communities practice Islam, it varies greatly. And I can full well understand and respect the confusion it is when people are trying to understand that spectrum and try to create policy with that in mind. But to your question specifically, the foreign funding that comes into countries like Indonesia are not only spent necessarily to construct mosques or create Islamic schools, but they can go to civic organizations, um, you know, like a women's club to do mm. uh, anything that is not really on its face a religious issue. But when that coming together, the way they engage, what they talk about, usually is um, built on a foundation of a very, very traditional and fundamentalist way of life. And that is what's advocated through conversation and socializing and, um, for example, in, in Ramadan, the activities that you would have that bring communities together. I, I've had conversations that, you know, take this with a grain of salt because it's anecdotal, but people don't want to talk about the fact that, for example, if the Indonesian government wants to push back on funding that they're not comfortable with, um, it's been alleged that the Saudi government will then come back and say, well, we won't give visas to Indonesians that want to come on pilgrimage to Saudi Arabia. Now, for practicing Muslims, like my mother even, like going on pilgrimage is a big deal. And so for a Muslim-majority country government to do something that can be perceived in the public space as preventing Muslims from practicing their faith, the nuances of the issue won't be discussed. It'll become another point that extremists can grab onto and say this government is not allowing you to be a good Muslim. Thank um, you. Uh, I appreciate Mr. Sanderson. Uh, there have been reports of Saudi Arabia collaborating with Indonesia on efforts to prevent radicalization uh, and uh, King Sal uh, Salman uh, visited Indonesia this spring. How effective do you think such uh, de-radicalization programs are, and is there a role for the U.S. in promoting peaceful ideologies? The government of Saudi Arabia does not have any interest in sponsoring groups or, or movements that would then target its own government, which they do. Um, so what the government may do bilaterally in this case does not always reflect what happens at a, at a different level among clergy, among wealthy individuals who want to fund more conservative ideologies, more conservative mosques, more conservative madrasas. So I applaud Saudi Arabia's effort to work with the Indonesian government. I think that is a good thing to do. But that is not the only channel of influence and money that comes from Saudi Arabia. A lot of that comes under the table or it comes privately. And I think that's important and that's what we should focus on. I think the U.S. has a, has a role certainly in promoting uh, a range of voices and making sure that there are um, uh, multiple sources of information and interpretations available to citizens of countries like Indonesia. Great. Thank you, Mr. Sanderson. I, I yield back, Mr. Chairman. Thank you for the time. Thank you, Ms. Wagner. We'll go to the ranking mem member, Mr. Sherman. We talked to the Saudis. They say they're not doing anything to promote extremist views. And I want to draw a distinction between intense orthodox Muslim on the one hand and Islam that has been perverted by those who teach hatred uh, or terrorist acts uh, against those they disagree with. Um, if a mosque says five times a day means five times a day, uh, no matter what, that doesn't hurt anybody. If it says fast, continue the fast until the sun goes down, and even if there's an ember and better wait another 20 minutes just in case, that doesn't hurt anybody. So I'm focused here on the madrasas and mosques that teach or preach a hatred 
uh, uh, and the uh, wisdom of, uh, of, of engaging in violence against those they disagree with. Um, Ms. Perry, you talk about Saudi Arabia uh, pushing Indonesia to have the right to fund certain uh, extremist organizations. Is that only anecdotal or do you have the facts that would allow me to confront the Saudi government with that? Unfortunately, so far only anecdotal, but- I'm gonna uh, ask every witness here to try to furnish sp specific instances where there is an organization, a mosque, an or a, a, a madras or other organization that you then identify has engaged in a particular act of, 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 of preaching or teaching uh, uh, hatred or terrorism so that we can turn that to the Saudis and say, are you funding any of these? And I would especially want you to highlight those that you have any evidence that the Saudis are in fact funding. Uh, I get all these anecdotal reports, then I get uh, a denial and then I go on to another subject. Um, does any witness here have an example of an entity uh, in Southeast Asia that uh, may, isn't a terrorist group, but which uh, preaches or teaches uh, uh, hatred or violence? Uh, Ms. Perry. There is an organization called Hezbollah Tahrir, which is not specifically connected to Saudi Arabia or any one country. Uh, that funds any type of extremism or fundamentalism. So but you're saying that this or, or this is an organization doing things on the ground in, in uh, Southeast Asia? Yes, as well as 40 other countries. And um, is this organization is funded by whom? Uh, multiple sources, apparently. Um, but the issue with his with career is, for example, there's even a chapter in the United States. I've attended one of their events uh, maybe two years ago in Virginia, where they're very comfortable with the, the headline of the conversation being, you know, a pro Khalifat or Khalifat in the U.S. or something like that. We're lucky in the United States that that. And you're using the term Khalifa. Uh, Islamic State specifically. And um, I went there just to see what kind of audience comes, mm -hmm. and I was very happy to say three people, if that, and they yeah. didn't look particularly interested in the topic. But if you look at his career in Indonesia, they have. Um, school organizations, they uh, send pamphlets out, they have conferences or book clubs, and, and Indonesia is only now. we don't know who funds them, but we think that Saudi individuals or government might. I don't think it's Saudi specifically, no. Well, but I don't I, say, I so. I, you th do you think their funds include uh, donors from the government or citizens of Saudi Arabia? It's, it's possible. Okay, I would ask you to, f to document for the record how this organization uh, preaches or teaches hatred, support for a caliphate. Uh, I, I point to that example. I, I mean, I, when I say support for a caliphate, I don't mean like the peaceful union of right. adjoining predominantly Muslim states. I mean, North and South Yemen joined together, and that's fine. It hasn't worked out so well, but it's not... Uh, it, if, if I may, I just mentioned his material to make the point that it is... Um, one of the most organized and most expansive okay. in terms of- Does any other witness have uh, sp specifics here on organizations that teach or preach uh, uh, hatred? I'll move on to another subject, broadcasting. Uh, how important is Voice of America and other US paid uh, broadcasting to the achieving the goals we're trying to achieve in Southeast Asia? Mr. Sanderson. I made a visit uh, many years ago in which I interviewed several militant groups in Indonesia, uh, the Philippines, and other areas. Um, in, and it also included engaging with the topic you're discussing here now in terms of putting a message out there to promote American values, to promote democracy, um, to give people alternative sources of information. There is a broad, broad community of individuals in these countries that are eager um, consumers of this information, but the groups that we are most concerned with have long ago rejected any kind of message coming from the United States, from their own government, from moderate imams in their communities. So when you speak of the influence of Voice of America, it is influential on people who may be too young to, m mm -hmm. to make a decision at this point. They haven't been influenced. Yeah, I mean, obviously somebody, you know. Yeah. Uh, but, 
but but the folks were concerned about those being recruited um, into battle. Well, they, I'm I'm I'm, I'm concerned with the ten year olds who might go one way or another when they're fifteen or twenty. I, I don't uh, know how appealing Voice of America is to a ten year old anywhere in the world. And to be their parents. And their parents. Yeah, yeah. And their parents. So, um, uh, it, it it could uh, could get to their parents. The parents could influence them. Right. But does anyone else have a comment, uh, Mr. Fuchs? Yeah, I would just say, um, agreeing uh, in part with my colleague, I would also, though, point out that uh, I think broadcasting mediums like VOA are part of a broader strategy that the United States and other countries, I think, can use very effectively to show people of the region, first of all, what the U.S. values are, but also as alternative uh, mediums for getting information, uh, as Mr. Sanderson pointed out. I think similarly, just as I mentioned in my testimony, uh, uh, vehicles like cultural and educational exchanges that the United States uh, supports in the region are vital. I understand that they may not be on the level of hundreds of thousands of people, but even so, on the level of hundreds of people and sometimes thousands of people, they have ripple effects in their communities. And so I think that supporting those sorts of uh, efforts are uh, very valuable. Thank you. My time has expired. <clears throat> I kind of want to just set the stage for the, you guys all probably know, I'm sure you know this very well, but when you look at the Asia Pacific region, you look at nation states, archipelago nations like the Philippines has 7,000 islands. Indonesia, 17,000 plus. I was reading where the government really doesn't know how many. I would hope they would. But when you look at that big of a landmass with that much separation between continuity of a country, I don't know how you police that, and so it's ripe for the development of a, any kind of a movement. You know, it could be peaceful, but in this case, we're looking at the growing threat, and I've got so many different questions, and you know, it's you and I, so we're gonna have fun. Um, and you guys will have to tolerate us, if you will, please. Um, but when you look at the, the land mass and just the logistics problem of policing, it just adds to the potential um, um, terrorist threat that can affect not just that region, but the whole world. You know, we've got more displaced people today than we have since World War II, and now we're adding another 400,000 are displaced just in the island of Mindanao. And so this is something that we have to take very seriously. It's something we have to get under control. And one of my first questions is, what have we learned from Afghanistan and Iraq with us going in there militarily without taking in the culture, the, the norms of a, a society, uh, tribal communities in the Middle East. What have we learned from there? Because in Robert Gates' book, that was one of the downfalls that we went in there. We we're gonna show them how America does it without taking into consideration what the people of those countries want. Uh, does anybody wanna tackle that, Ms. Sanderson? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Let me first indicate or suggest that our familiarity with the cultures in Southeast Asia is better than it was with Afghanistan, for certain. Uh, it doesn't mean it's perfect, but we've, of course, had a long history in the Philippines. We have a good relationship with Malaysia and Indonesia, so we're more familiar with those nations. We've had bilateral exchanges, multilateral exchanges with them on a law enforcement, military, uh, civilian level, so, so we're in better shape there. Um, but nonetheless, you still have to work with your local partners. What we've learned in Afghanistan is legion. Well, I hope we've learned it, but what we've observed is quite comprehensive. One of the most important things in consideration of your comment is it's not easy or effective to work with corrupt governments. And if we do not have good partners on the other side and we have a mixed bag here in Southeast Asia, then we will not be that successful. Also, you mentioned the, the number of islands, 23,000 plus among those two. 1,000 islands in Indonesia are uh, inhabited, 600 permanently inhabited. So there's a lot of space where these guys can go and do various activities. However, they do need infrastructure in order to carry out activities. So not all of those places are hospitable even to militant groups, but it's a big space. Encouraging more activity in the maritime space is excellent as Dr. Greitens point out. Um, and, uh, and I hope we do do that. Okay, Dr. Greiten, let me move to you. Um, Reading your testimony here, from 2002 to 2015, the U.S. deployed several hundred special operations personnel to the southern Philippines uh, for counterterrorism purposes. Why was that not effective? Why? I feel like this has kind of just been off the radar. I'm sure there's a select few that were there that were aware of this, 
but it seems like from a U.S. foreign policy standpoint, this is something that's kind of bypassed us, and it's like, uh-oh, we now, now we have to catch up. Why was that not effective in what we're doing? You know, and I'll take just the number of um, uh, insurgents we thought that were in Marawi. It was, what, two to 300? Now we, we know it's over four or 500, and there's no telling how many it's going to be. What's your thoughts on that? Thank you. Um, sir, I think that the, uh, the decision to wind down the task force was a, a product of two different uh, factors, one of which was an estimation perhaps that the task force had been more successful in its primary mission, which had to do more with Abu Sayyaf than, uh, than what was going on on, on the land. Um, so the, the Joint Special Operations Task Force in the Philippines was principally uh, dealing with Abu Sayyaf. And at the time, there was a peace process underway in Mindanao, which uh, there's a, an agreement reached in 2014, the year before the task force terminated in January of 2015. Um, I'm sorry, February of 2015, I believe. Um, and so, you know, at the time, things in Mindanao looked like they were perhaps coming together a, a little bit better than they were. Um, so that's one factor that I think uh, affected the, the decision. Uh, as I, I know that you're aware, Secretary Mattis has stated that, that perhaps that decision was premature. Um, but the other factor that I think uh, we, are, we have to think about is that what's happened in the Middle East has produced displacement effects into Southeast Asia. And so we're also seeing, um, you know, as pressures exerted against Islamic State in the Middle East, that the Philippines has become more appealing. And these, these groups that splintered away from the MILF, um, some of whom have been in the lead, really, in, in Marawi, um, are uh, both a little bit different and, and driven by different factors than were the, the principal emphasis for the, the Joint Special Operations Task Force Philippines. But um, as you noted in my testimony, I think if the Philippine government recommends it, uh, that's something the U.S. should at least be willing to consider among a range of other options. Thank you. That's, that's what we need to be prepared for because as these um, uh, radicals, the terrorists come back over, the fighters come back over, being displaced from Iraq, Syria, wherever, that they are going to come there and there's going to be a coalition or a, a, um, they're going to coalesce together and it's going to form a stronger, it's going to be ISIS part two. And that's what I think we all need to be concerned about and that's what we're trying to prevent. And so I'm going to go to you, Ms. Peary. Um, you're, uh, one of the questions I wanted to ask you is about the internet and social media and how it's all interconnected. Um, how could the U.S. government working with the regional governments uh, work with social media and other technological companies to reduce terrorist groups' ability to leverage social media platforms to spread their extremist messages. Uh, do you have any recommendations on that? I think there needs to be encouragement to have a collaboration between the government, specifically its law enforcement arms and its intelligence services to work with the private sector to look at what the infrastructure specifically looks like. As I mentioned in my testimony, for example, if Indonesia has 70 percent of the servers, that serves, that proliferates the information in the entire region. That's an opportunity for the Philippines to go directly to Indonesia and have a conversation. It can be as simple as getting them to talk to each other to understand what information they have, what these, what, where the companies are that run the servers, what, whether there is an opportunity to further that collaboration with the companies like Facebook and Twitter, which are saying more and more that they're willing to take down extremist information and propaganda. And, and the second part of that, as I mentioned also in my testimony, is taking down the extremist propaganda is only half of the problem. You have to replace it with an understanding of Islam that not only talks about tolerance and plural, pluralism, excuse me, but also rejects ISIS propaganda point by point. And that is something that only the local governments within the region can do if they support the grassroots organizations in their respective countries. All right. And, you know, that's, you know, when you look at it, it just seems like such a daunting task. You've got the 23,000 islands or whatever it is um, to try to police that. And you have, you know, different nations in there, different rules of law, uh, different levels of um, the rule of law. How do, you, how do you police that? And I don't know if you can take an island like Mindanao and just say, we're going to shut down the Internet. And, and I know this is getting broadcast, and I'm gonna, people are going to say I'm against First uh, Amendment, and I'm not. We're trying to get something under control that if we don't get it under control, we're going to be fighting for generations and generations. And certainly we've seen that in the Middle East. Um, and Mr. Fuchs, I wanted to ask you, um, because one of the things 
that we learned, and you had recommended it here, it was in one of your opening statements, was to go in and, excuse me, in the long run, managing the, uh, the security challenge and preventing it from growing into a more direct threat to the U.S. interests, above all else, requires capable governments, I think we're all in agreement with that, that follow the rule of law, prioritize sustainability and equitable, equitable economic growth strategies, and which protect the values of human rights and tolerance and work to strengthen democratic institutions. This is something I've struggled with for years in foreign relations because we all agree with that. I mean, those are the, the founding principles, the core values of our country, and of course it's taken us over 200, 300 years to get to this point, and we fought several wars to protect these rights, number one, to get them to, and to protect them. And when you go into a country, a foreign country, and we're, certainly we learned this in the Middle East, to, to instill our values and say this is a part of the process, um, I'd like to hear your thoughts. Should that be at the beginning, or should that be the goal and bring that country to those beliefs as success happens? Because what I see is the foreign policies of the past, we put these um, conditions and say this is the only way we're going to help you if you do these things. And we, we put that up here instead of focusing on peace, security, rule of law, and the good governance. What are your thoughts on that? And how can we do that different and yet accomplish that, say maybe over a five to ten year goal, if we're working in that direction? I think everybody would be better off. Absolutely. I think that's uh, a great question. The, I think the reality is that you have to do all of it at once, unfortunately, uh, as difficult as it is. I think that one of the things to recognize about Southeast Asia as compared to, say, the Middle East or some other places is that over the arc of the last few decades, we've actually been dealing with a better and better situation uh, on that time span. These are countries that have become more democratic, transitioned from authoritarian to democratic in many instances. And so, for instance, in a country like Indonesia, we actually have a partner government that is relatively capable in certain aspects and that we can work with on a lot of these very, very challenging issues. The Philippines, I will say, which has been up and down right now, is a much more difficult task and I think is a good example of exactly the the challenge that you're raising here because with President Aquino up until last year, the United States, I think, was able to support a lot of uh, aspects of Filipino policy that would get at the roots of terrorism in the region, including strengthening anti-corruption efforts growing the economy, uh, which I think are important aspects of that. But with President Duterte, whose interests and policies are quite different, his respect for human rights seems quite low, frankly, in, in my estimation, it makes it much more difficult for the United States to, at the, one, at the one hand, make sure that we are partnering with him and his government to go after terrorist groups and other security threats, while at the same time not condoning the sorts of heavy-handed tactics that he has been using domestically uh, in his uh, fight against drugs. Um, and I just want to end with this before I go to uh, my colleague over here, Mr. Connolly. Uh, it was nice to see that President Trump called the leaders of those nations and that Vice President uh, Pence went down there and then uh, Secretary Tillerson has put an emphasis on that area and uh, General Mattis participating in the Shangri-La Shangri Dialogue. The, the, the message that I want to come out of this hearing today, out of this committee that goes out, that's being broadcast, is that America is back and our focus is on the Asia-Pacific region. And we're focusing on economics, trade, national security, and as you've brought up multiple times, cultural exchanges, mm -hmm. because I think that's the, the one missing link that we haven't done in the Middle East like we should have. And that's an emphasis that we want to put on that. And with that, I'm going to turn to a, uh, my good friend, Mr. Connolly from Virginia. I thank the chair. <clears throat> um, uh, though I must say, um, I hardly think America's back. Uh, I think in the brief uh, six or seven months of this administration, we've done nothing but retreat, including from this area. Uh, nothing is more catastrophic, uh, starting with uh, the, w the retreat from the uh, Trans-Pacific Partnership uh, it creates an enormous void in this region and gives enormous opportunities to our rival, China. And uh, maybe some think that's a great leap forward. I think it's a great leap backward. 
and definitely not in U.S. interest. And, uh, and the proof of that was within one week. Uh, Beijing convened a meeting in Beijing of all the remaining TPP partners to see if they could carve out a trade, a, a trade agreement that circumscribed that part of the globe, but without us and without our standards. Uh, I also think it was an enormous retreat and again gave the Chinese in this part of the world an enormous diplomatic uh, advantage uh, in, in withdrawing unilaterally from the Paris Climate Accord. Uh, we, we are now in the happy company of two countries, exactly, Nicaragua and Syria. What a proud moment for the United States. And if that's called, you know, we're back again, I'd, I'd rather not be. Um, so I, I think there are other points of view about what has happened in this brief period of time. And I, I honestly believe that those two things actually will be seen by history uh, akin to our refusal to ratify the League, uh, the, the Treaty of Versailles, uh, that most certainly helped precipitate uh, a uh, successor war to World War I, the war to end all wars, but that's a different matter. Um, let me ask, uh, Mr. Fuchs, uh, I, I don't know, I thought I heard kind of squishy language from you just now on the Philippines. Um, this is a dictator who has said, have at it, vigilante violence, and I think the number I've seen is 7,000 dead that we know of. He's even advocated for rape as a tactic, as a, as a tool in order to uh, get rid of what he has decided are criminal elements and druggies and drug dealers and drug users and undesirables. Now, my friend Mr. Yoho read from a statement quite correctly that our goal is to establish governments, capable governments that follow the rule of law. There's, how is this a capable government other than being more efficient in killing people in extra judicial ways that certainly the United States cannot condone, let alone the rule of law. I mean, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but you sounded like, well, except for that. <coughs> Granted, that's a little messy. But other than that, we've got strategic goals we share. Well, I mean, Duterte hasn't even been consistent in that respect. I mean, one day he likes China, one day he likes us. I mean, he's threatening, he's not threatening. He could cut a deal with China, he could throw us out. Uh, my head spins with this guy, uh, who seems, frankly, unstable and thuggish, if not murderous. Hardly a partner we want to do business with, though we do. Uh, but we'll get to that in a minute. So did you want to clarify your squishy remarks? or? <laughs> uh, sure. Thank you, Congressman. Um, well, uh, I will try to uh, restate. I think what I was getting at, which is that this is a very, very difficult challenge. And I think that without a doubt, democracy and human rights needs to be an essential component of our strategy for a wide variety of goals, but including counterterrorism in Southeast Asia. Now, the United States obviously has a long time alliance with the Philippines, with the previous government, with President Aquino. There was, I think, a very robust partnership on democracy and human rights, as well as a variety of other issues. At the same time, I don't think that the terrible things that President Duterte is doing, and they are absolutely terrible, and I think that they merit a response from the United States, some of which I know that uh, you and your representative and your colleagues have already tried to send uh, in a number of different ways. I think that at the same time, we need to focus on what our interests are, and they are in supporting democracy and human rights in that country, supporting economic growth, and ensuring that our security interests are met. And so I think that while we do not break off diplomatic relations altogether with the country, there are a variety of things that the United States needs to be doing to send the messages to Duterte about how unhappy we are uh, with what he's me. pursuing. Can is, I? is one of those things to invite him among the very first international <laughs> leaders to come visit Washington and the White House? And that was exactly going to be my next point, which I actually is it's just as soon as President Trump made that invitation, I actually wrote a piece that said specifically the president should not 
be inviting the president of the Philippines here. But I think that there are also a number of other things that we can be considering doing to send our dis to signals of our displeasure, including uh, the potential of cutting off certain types of assistance to the Philippines. Uh, the Leahy vetting process is one way of uh, doing this that already exists, but there, frankly, are other types of cooperation with law enforcement and with the armed forces of the Philippines that, frankly, can be uh, suspended uh, or cut off uh, to show him that there is a red line that he is crossing right now in the way that he is running his country and that our cooperation is not a blank check. I knew you weren't squishy. <laughs> um, let me ask you one final question on this one and then I'm going to turn to Mr. Sanderson um, on foreign aid. But, um, so the Duterte government decided that uh, they needed a special envoy to the United States of America. And uh, in light of what you just said, do you believe the selection of Jose Antonio, who is a business partner with Donald Trump in building a tower in the Philippines, uh, is an appropriate choice and sends the right signal? Or, I mean, is this somebody with whom we can do business? Is this somebody who is designed to flatter the president, but not to ameliorate a, a real human rights crisis underway in the Philippines as we speak? I completely agree with you that this is sending exactly the wrong signal. Um, and I think that it's actually indicative of a broader problem that we may have uh, with uh, the relations of the United States and the countries in this region right now and President Trump's conflict, conflicts of interest, his businesses and his conflicts of interest, and what that might wreak on our relationships in the region. That is one example. But frankly, their corruption is a widespread problem in Southeast Asia. Uh, it's a way of doing business in some of these countries, unfortunately. And part of the problem is that one of the signals that has been sent to some of these countries by President Trump's unwillingness to get rid of his business uh, holdings before taking office is that the United States right now may actually be moving closer <laughs> to them uh, in terms of the way we do business and that the result of that in part might be more uh, uh, envoys like this or more uh, uh, entreaties to the United States about business. It's why a number of ethicists, both Republican and Democrat, strongly advocated an absolute blind trust so that you weren't having ongoing questions tainting foreign policy as well as other kinds of decisions. Unfortunately, that advice was not taken. Um, I, I don't want, wish to impose uh, on the chairman, so uh, if he will allow me one, just one last set of questions, and I don't mean to preclude anyone else who may want to comment, uh, but I thought I'd put it to you first, Mr. Sanderson, listening to your testimony. Uh, we, if you look at the, the budget submitted by the president and apparently supported by the Secretary of State, Mr. Tillerson, we make some very substantial cuts in foreign assistance programs, including democracy building efforts in the countries we're talking about here today, uh, in, ter in terms of humanitarian services, in terms of uh, inst you know, uh, institution building, uh, you name it, co-ops, health clinics, uh, small micro businesses, women owned businesses, empowerment, all that stuff, uh, where we've been doing a lot of good work actually for quite some time. And we actually have some metrics that show uh, some results. It takes a little time, but you know, um, all of that's cut. I mean, not just cut, really cut. I mean, right to the bone. And to make it all special, apparently Secretary Tillerson is thinking of absorbing USAID into State Department as just another bureau even though their missions are quite different. Um, I wonder if you could comment on that. How does that help us in the mission we're talking about in this region if, I mean, this America's back again, it looks another example to me of, no, we're not, we're retreating. And again, allowing the Chinese to enter that vacuum with their foreign assistance, which isn't as punctilious or meritorious uh, as ours in terms of setting metrics that have to be met and making sure the clear rationales that benefit large numbers of people. It, nor does it come with the oversight that ours does. Um, you, you bring up some great points, Congressman. Uh, I think it is a mistake to cut the State Department's budget at all, but I understand that all budgets are, are going to be uh, uh, coming under the knife except for Not DOD. Not defense. Yeah, except for DOD. So, but that does recall Secretary and then General Mattis' comments during his confirmation hearing when he said, if you cut the State Department, I have to buy more bullets. 
Um, I do think uh, those budgets will not be cut that sharply. I hope they're not cut much at all because those are tremendously important programs. They seed the, the field with um, a lot of positive things that have short, medium, and long-term benefits. Uh, we are a great partner overseas. I see it in all the countries that I go to. And people want the assistance that covers everything from military to civilian to economic judicial, you name it, they want that activity. It is an important part of counterterrorism because you are strengthening economies in communities. When you have idle hands, they get pulled into the gray market and then they get pulled into militant groups sometimes. Um, to your comment about engagement, the president has sent mixed messages, but largely messages about retreat. His national security staff, which is superb, goes out after those messages and tries to reassure our allies. So we have gone into Asia, into Southeast Asia, to reassure our allies. These are important relationships. The Department of Defense likes to say they, that you can't surge trust. When you're dealing with a complicated environment like Southeast Asia, like foreign fighters, and all the insurgencies that you have there, a good, healthy, widespread, multifaceted relationship between the United States and our Asian partners in Southeast Asia in particular is excellent for the counterterrorism partnerships. If the rest of the relationship is good, that often uh, redounds to the, to the other issues that we're looking at. And that's why I would encourage deep engagement and budgets that do bring American culture, society, and engagement on a high level. Thank you. And I appreciate that dialogue, and I can always appreciate my colleague bringing the politics into this. <laughs> um, <laughs> But truth be known, TPP wouldn't pass or wouldn't support in the House, either Republicans or Democrats, or in the Senate, Republicans or Democrats. So it was off the table. It was a good call, so it can be renegotiated. And that's why we put in free trade agreements with many countries in the Asia Pacific uh, that we're working on now. And um, let's see, what was the other one? I forget. Um, you were talking about, Paris oh, the Paris climate. <laughs> And again, that would have put this country at a disadvantage. We are going to lead on energy, and you're going to see great things come out of that. Um, and so I, I do feel like we are back in that area. The president being down there, the secretary of state, and the, the, the State Department is, is light on people. People are working double time in these positions. Over 130 positions have been um, 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 appointed. They just haven't gone through the process in the Senate, and so it's a it's it's being held up in the Senate again. Um, but I do want to point out, you're talking, Mr. Future, you're talking about the importance of diplomatic relations in that area. <clears throat> you said strong diplomatic ties will help thwart terrorism. Have we not had that over the last eight years in the previous administration? I mean, um, what's your thoughts on that, or anybody else that wants to weigh in on that? Well, I think that um, we actually have had very positive relationships with a number of the countries in the region over the last eight years. And of course, it does not mean that you're going to prevent every terrorist threat uh, from uh, uh, spawning in the region. Um, but I think that fundamentally, you're not going to get anything done on counterterrorism in the region if you do not have those strong diplomatic relationships, because again, these are the ones who have the relationships with their counterparts in the governments in Indonesia and Malaysia and the Philippines. They're the ones who have the best information about what's going on in cities and towns and villages in these countries and the best feel for these countries. And so they really are the front lines here in Southeast Asia for our counterterrorism strategy. Of course, they are not 100% of the strategy, but they are an essential component of it. Okay. And then I guess my question is, if, if we've got these great relationships, uh, did we just drop the ball on this? Did we not follow up, or was this just behind the scene? We were distracted by North Korea, um, the Middle East. Anybody's thoughts on that? If I, I'm sorry. Well, I, w I would remark that we do have a very full plate worldwide. And, we sure do. And, and it is hard to dedicate uh, sufficient energy to every single relationship. And then when things like Marawi, the Battle of Marawi, uh, flare up, then we shift our resources here. And, and so it is a question of resources and attention. Um, but, you know, that gets also back to cutting budgets and making sure the Senate, you know, moves people through and whatnot, which I hope that you do because w we do re retain the leadership position globally. We do need to be a part of most of these 
issues and in solving problems. And um, and I, I don't know if it's a question of dropping the ball or just being distracted by so many. Well, problems. and and you know, you look at where we are as a nation. We're twenty trillion dollars in debt. I was at a meeting last night. They said our deficit spending. Next year is going to be around $750 billion. We're getting worse. There are going to be some austerity measures. We want to make sure that we cut in the right area, and I agree with General Mattis. If you cut foreign aid, you're going to have to buy more bullets, and that's certainly not the direction we want. So we want to have strong diplomacy. We want to have strong policies, and we want to make sure that the, the ideas that you give us that we can enact in the legislation are um, that much stronger. And I think I had one more question, and it was for you, Dr. Greiton. Uh, talking about North Korea funneling money through there, what nexus does that go through? Does that go through any of the Chinese banks or any of the world banks that we could put secondary sanctions on? Yeah, uh, it does both, sir. So Good. North Korea has revenue generating operations throughout Southeast Asia. And one of the things that we've seen in recent months is that countries in Southeast Asia, Singapore, Malaysia, um, uh, some other countries in the region have actually started to tighten down on some of these North Korean revenue generating operations. Um, there's banking that, that uh, goes through Singapore and some of the other financial nodes in the region. But as, as you indicated, um, a lot of the companies that do business with North Korea, around 80 percent, um, maybe 90 percent, uh, are of North Korea's trade is with China. And so from both a banking and a trade perspective, um, China is really the dominant actor. That said, North Korea has been very good at adapting when one source of revenue or one set of banking networks comes under pressure. <coughs> and so um, I have in the past advocated for the United States to engage on the North Korean question in Southeast Asia, in part to keep North Korea from moving its center of activity to Southeast Asia if China comes under, under pressure. Um, and I think, that's, I think that's an important part. The Philippines, according to the World Trade Organization, is the, the third largest trade partner of North Korea today after India and China. Um, and that's not insignificant. So we should be putting all tools on the table. We really do, and of course we just saw that um, um, load of ivory tusks, I think it was 7,000 pounds, um, that just got um, uh, confiscated. And those are kind of things that are funding terrorist organizations and it doesn't serve humanity. Uh, I can't tell you how much I appreciate it. And again, feel free to offer suggestions that we can do uh, legislation with. We've done this in the past and uh, I look forward to your input. I thank you for your time. I value your time and everybody else here. So with that, uh, we thank the panel for joining us today to share their experience and this meeting is adjourned.